here. Um, it's been a while. I'm it's delighted. been a while, definitely. I'm delighted. Thank you so much. And I'm so thrilled and, and really been looking forward to this. And a warm welcome to, to, to everyone. And my heartiest congratulations on the on the fantastic work you guys have been leading. And thank you very, very much for your inspiration to the world and a warm welcome to everybody. And, and she is so terrific to get to, to welcome you too. And I'm thrilled that uh, you know we're able to have you here. And I just wanna say this festival is really, everybody's here. So, um, uh, you know, a big warm embrace and bienvenidos a todos. And I'm really thrilled that we've, you know, it's here now. Thank you. So I'll let you start. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me today. Hola a todos. I'm super excited. Um, I'll be giving a uh, pretty long speech. So if you guys get bored, we can take a break or something, or I'll try to make it interactive as well. I'll ask you some questions. Um, but yeah, uh, my name is Shia Bastida. I'm 18 years old. I'm um, part of the organization Re-Earth Initiative that I co-founded, and I also organized with Fridays for Future. And I'm a student at the University of Pennsylvania studying environmental studies with a concentration in policy and international relations, trying to minor in environmental management. So like all of us, I'm sure I'm trying to balance school and activism and our lives uh, in the pandemic, which is hard, but we're all here and we're all doing it. Um, and I feel like a lot of the times I start uh, talking about my journey as an activist, but this time I'm gonna go way back to my grandfather's story and then my parents' story, because I think it's important that we kind of know that there are a lot of people behind us uh, intergenerationally. So my grandfather was born in 1932. He's pretty old now. And I think it's awesome that he's still here to tell me all the stories about when he was younger. And I've definitely sat, you know, we've all sat in the dinner table listening to what he has to say. And he told, he used to tell us stories about my town, San Pedro Tultepec, which is uh, about 40 minutes away from Mexico City. And he, he told us stories like, you know, this used to be a lake and th this town used to be an island. So imagine my town, my town is pretty high up. It's like 18,000 meters above sea level. And it's surrounded by like lower land. So it, it was an island. And the people in the town used to you know, use that as their resource. Like the food from the lake used to be food. The, the fish from the lake used to be food. The tule, which is something that you weave, is what people used to use as their sust economic sustenance. That, that's what they would sell in Mexico City to, you know, feed their families or other things. And it was a reciprocal relationship with the land. It was really stable. It was really happy. And then in, in the 1940s, Mexico City started taking water away from my town because Mexico City started expanding. There were a lot of people moving in. Mexico City now has a population of 27 million people, um, including the metropolitan area, which is huge. And so they need a lot of water. And my town was one of the towns that was used as a water resource. And that completely changed the biocultural relationship of the people in the town with their surroundings because all of a sudden you couldn't go to the lake to get food you couldn't go to get tule to make things to sell and that was one of the first um kind of incoming companies that destabilized the stability of my town and as my dad was growing up my dad was born in 1968 so obviously not as young as my grandfather. <laughs> um, he started seeing the second wave of companies coming in. And these companies were noxious companies. So we're talking about factories, we're talking about, um, you know, just companies that would literally throw all of their waste in our river and our lake. So I think it was a gradual change between 
taking things away from us and then contaminating what we had left. So even as people were adapting to the new um, way of living, it was still being uh, affect. It was still um, being affected and it was still being taken away from us. And my dad actually has been working to clean our lake, our, sorry, our river for the past 20 years. So, so before I was born, my dad and my mom have been working to clean up our lake. And it's something that they have still not accomplished because there's so much money going into um, these companies who are paying off a lot of our politicians. And you know, there's a lot of corruption that goes on. But at the end of the day, what's affected is our way of life, our quality of life, the quality of our water, the quality of our air. And in my town, you actually don't have to pay for water because Mexico City says that it's like our reparation that we get free water. So we get water every week. And sometimes we actually don't get water at all. So it's Wednesday and water is supposed to come on Wednesdays and sometimes it just doesn't come. And that's a type of instability that we also have to deal with. Um, and I guess here's where I want to talk more about my dad's side of the story. So my dad, the whole community is supposed to be an indigenous community, but because of colonization and all of these things, a lot of people lost touch with their culture, uh, especially because it was really stigmatized at some point. If you were native, you were told that you weren't like at level with society, right? And I think this is something that we see all around the world, unfortunately. But my dad said, why would that, would, why would I be ashamed of that? Why would I not wanna be part of my culture? So he actually learned two indigenous languages um, and he started speaking for indigenous rights all around the world in UN conferences and COPs. And that's where he met my mom in 1992 in, in Rio de Janeiro. So, and then they met again in Ecuador in another climate conference. So I would say that my parents, as my grandfather, they have also been fighting for the stability of the planet as a whole and my town. Um, and I just wanna point out now that my town is not the only one that's gone through these things. There's actually 1.1 million oil and gas wells only in the US. So there's actually millions of towns around the world who are being stripped away of their rights and stripped away of their biodiversity, of their culture and of our futures, literally. And I guess this is where I come in. I was born in 2002. Um, my parents were you know, still studying. My, both of them are PhDs and both of them studied sustainable development. Um, and I was born into this world where my parents taught me that our role in life is to protect Mother Earth because Mother Earth gives us everything we need. And it's a type of reciprocal relationship that I embodied when I was growing up. Um, you know, we always would thank, when we got food, we would always thank all the steps that, all the people that it took to get to our plates, you know, thank the people who harvested, thank the people who made it, thank the people who transported it. It was more conscious. You actually are conscious of the path that your food takes, the path that a lot of the things that we take for granted take. And I basically saw the whole world thought, like saw the world like I saw it. I thought the whole world saw the world as, you know, something that we have to take care of. And as I grew older, I obviously saw that this relationship was actually not respected. I started noticing in my own community how companies were polluting our river and our lake. I saw how, you know, just news about oil spills, news about wildfires that started coming in, news about, you know, melting ice. And back then, the main picture of climate change would be the polar bear that's like sinking. And even that like got to me because now we're trying to shift away from that narrative that it only affects the poles, even though it does, we're trying to shift the narrative to it also affects people. And, and I think we are doing a great job of doing that, but it doesn't mean that that doesn't still get to our hearts. 
and, and it doesn't mean that it doesn't affect your feelings. So as I saw the reality of how the world, how people were treating Mother Earth, um, I started to kind of think about why we were doing this. And at around the same time was when my hometown suffered from uh, its first flood because we had been in drought for several years. And all of a sudden there was too much rain that didn't stop. And it affected small businesses. It affected our crops. It affected um, everything. And I left my town the day after the flood uh, because my parents had a job in a job offer in New York City. So we were supposed to leave already. So I left my town without knowing how the town had recovered. Um, and it actually, well, it didn't recover that well. If you think about a small town of 10,000 people that doesn't have resources, that doesn't have infrastructure to deal with this type of things, that it's not prepared to deal with anomalies like this, then it's obvious why people would um, not be able to, to deal with the effects of flood. And when I got to New York, I saw what Hurricane Sandy had done to Long Island because my, grand, my godfather lives there. So he showed us the destruction that it had caused all across the coast of Long Island. And that's one of the moments where I realized the global scope of the climate crisis. It's not an isolated incident in the North Poles and in my town, but it's happening all across the world in different ways. And that was like a turning point for me because I saw how real it was. I saw that it wasn't happening in 50 or 100 years. I saw that we were not, my parents were not fighting for something that was a what if, they were fighting for something that was already happening. And that the destruction of the company, that is the destruction that the companies were causing were perpetuating that. And the communities most affected were the least responsible. Um, so that's kind of my journey and a lot of our journeys as youth. Um, and I bring the story up of my grandfather and my parents here because I really wanna highlight that this is an intergenerational fight, but, but that right now it's falling on our generation to push through because it's never, we've never been at such a turning point in history where we have not 10 years anymore. We have around seven and a half years uh, to cut our carbon emissions to stay below 1.5 degrees of warming. And when people ask me, why do you keep going? It's because there's a huge difference between one and two and three and four and five and six degrees. All of those degrees are, you know, they could cause such a difference in our quality of life and our children's life and our grandchildren's life. And so that's why we have to go into this with attitude and optimism and, and knowing that we can change the world because we have to. Um, and here's where I like to talk about some of the things that prevent people from acting on the climate crisis. There's a lot of climate psychology that I've studied and I would like to share some of, of them with you because I think that it's really important that the youth movement recognizes why people are not acting. Why, if it's so evident for us, why isn't it so evident for the whole world? Why aren't the billions of people around the world stopping what they're doing and incorporating climate activism, climate justice into their lives. And so I'm going to share with you seven psychological facts as to why people don't act. Um, and some of them have been present in my own journey and I'm sure your journeys as well. The first one is um, distance, psychological distance. So this means us thinking that the climate crisis is happening in 50 or 100 years, which is what I thought. And this prevents people from actually saying, oh, I have to start doing something now because it's actually happening right now. So I think that for this, we have to expand our meaning of what the climate crisis means. The climate crisis is food insecurity. The climate crisis is mass migration by climate disasters. The climate crisis is like a lot of these things that are not only not, uh, disasters and natural disasters. Um, the second one is finite pool of worry. So when I think about this, I think about a family, like my family, who we don't have a lot of 
money or anything. And I think about how you care more about putting food on the table. You care more about paying rent. You care more about being able to pay for electricity. How can you go to a family like that and tell them you have to care about the polar bears in the North Pole? It just sounds irrational. It just sounds insensitive. So what we have to do as the youth movement is empower the communities with knowledge about the companies that are coming in and destroying your livelihood are the climate crisis. The companies who are coming in and polluting your air and your water are the climate crisis. So if you want a better quality of life, then we all have to fight the climate crisis together. So that's how I deal with finite pool of worry. Uh, the next one is emotional numbing. And I think this goes into climate grief and we all go through that. Um, and it's a feeling of there's so many things going on, what can I do? And what I did is I started really small. I started joining my environmental club. So just you being here, just you watching this is already taking the first step. Just you refusing the plastic bag is already taking the first step. And that can grow as much as you want it to grow. So never feel like there's nothing to do because every decision that we take in every moment of our lives actually makes a difference. Somebody once told me, if you wanna know why you are where you are, look at your past. If you wanna know your future, look at your present. And it sounds so obvious, but the reality is that we don't take charge of our power of agency enough. We, I don't think I have ever been as conscious of what I do every single moment until I, know, until I realize that it does have an impact on my future. So if all of us right now took charge of our presence, our future would be different. And that really empowers me because if we can share that with the world, if we can share that our everyday decisions ha can have structural impact, I think that's really empowering, especially when people think that individual actions don't uh, can, like can't change the world because they can. The next one is confirmation bias. This is like misinformation on the internet, uh, reading things that fit your perspective, uh, just absorbing information that fits whatever you care about. So if I think that the climate crisis is not real, I'm just going to absorb that type of information. And for here, we have to counteract it with meeting people where they're at, because a lot of people don't know what the IPCC report is. I don't, I don't, a lot of people don't know what a COP is. A lot of people don't know what parts per million are. When you say I was born at 312 parts per million, people are like, that means nothing to me. So we have to meet people where they're at. I've met people who are like, can you explain global warming to me? And I'm like, of course I can explain global warming to you. We all start somewhere and it's our job as climate activists to make the information as accessible as possible and make spaces as inviting as possible. Um, and I also think that's where intersectionality comes in for sure. Uh, the next thing is defaults or status quo. We have been using oil for, you know, a hundred years. Why would we stop? So I feel like those are some of the things that we have to break because we get caught up in habit. How do we break the cycle of relying on oil? It's by being creative and innovative and breaking barriers and getting out of our comfort zone. And it is possible and humanity has done it for years, but we are too reliant on what we're used to. Um, the next thing is discounting. So if I ask you, when would you rather lose a hundred dollars now or in 10 years, you're probably gonna say in 10 years. If I ask you, when would you rather win a hundred dollars now or in 10 years, you're gonna say now. And that's what happens with companies. They wanna make money now. They don't care if they turn sustainable and then they make, they actually recover money in 10 years. And that's another thing that we have to break because we have to not only care about our individual um, kind of wins, we have to, care about our collective wins. So $100 for all of us in 10 years might be better if the planet is better. It is better if the planet is better, <laughs> for sure. And the last thing is ideology. A lot of us have political ideologies that 
kind of prevent us from maybe looking at the bigger picture. And for me, like, I don't think there's an issue that we can say is as global as possible as the climate crisis. And I see that my time is about to run out. So I would just leave you with one thing, definitely take care of yourselves. We have to live in a regenerative world. We have to make sure that we don't burn out. And it's not about being perfect climate activists. It's about billions of people doing their best. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Adachi. Um, you're, honestly, you're so inspirational and so amazing. Um, before we go ahead, we would like to just give everyone a bit of information about what the event we're here for. So we're here to discuss youth activism in the 21st century. And before we go ahead with that, we would just like to introduce Dr. Ash. Um, Dr. Ash, would you like to introduce yourself or we could introduce you? Uh, you don't really, you know, worry about that. I just want to say that, um, uh, you know, I'm just delighted to be able to be here together with all of you. And I want to say a big thank you for that powerful and inspirational message and to the beautiful POP family that we are able to be together with here today. My congratulations to you, Ragini, and, and to Aoife, to Camila, Meta, all of you for um, you know, exemplifying this and she, uh, for you to be able to be here to, to really give us that, that powerful message you just shared, um, where I think all of us need to start to think about the, the role we can play and to start where, wherever we are to take that first step and, and jump into this. So I just want to say a big thank you. Uh, my name is Ash, uh, and I'm with the pop movement. And I just want to say a big welcome to to the festival and this is really all yours. So take it away guys, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ash. Um, so to discuss the importance of youth activism, we've honestly, we've got amazing activists from all around the world. So we've got people from Mexico, from Australia, from South Korea. And uh, we'd like to begin with the first round of introduction. So we have Aoife Mercedes from the UK. And yeah, take it away Aoife. Thank you so much. So hello, hello. Um, so yeah, I'm Aoife Mercedes Rodriguez Ochoa, quite a long name, um, but yeah, I'm a 16 year old activist and I live in the UK, as Regina just said, thank you. Um, but I mean, I'll just give myself a bit of a short introduction here, um, as the focus is very much on the voices of Kelsey and Cherry today. Um, but essentially, I've just, I've been quite heavily involved in activism quite recently, I think. Um, I mean, it started more than a year ago, that's for sure. However, I think due to the coronavirus pandemic, I feel like we all dealt with that situation in our own different ways. And personally, that was just by throwing myself at activism and just especially climate activism. Um, again, thank you so much here for coming along and giving us that insight. Like, I think there are, there are so many elements of there that really rang true. And also I, it, they're the kind of things that really cause you to think. And I thank everyone else for coming along. And I really do appreciate this, especially the pop family who have honestly been such a wonder and um, even more so during the, the time of um, the COVID-19 pandemic. So I thank you all for that. And I also thank everyone for coming along and also for those and um, perhaps watching this, um, this live stream. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. And I will pass on to Camila, who again is a wonder um, and we'll give you a bit of an introduction to herself. The only wonderful people out here is the amazing activists in, in this session. Um, so my name is Camila Gonzalez Colistro. I am a 17 year old activist from Mexico City, Mexico. And I, I, I don't have such a incredible background story such as she does. Um, I, my family does is not into activism of any sort. Uh, I come from a, I would not say traditional family, but a very um, kind of laying below the surface of political issues. Um, I started my 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 path as an activist um, a couple of years ago when the Fridays for Future movement came to Mexico uh, for the first time and. It was the first approach I had to politics. And it was a moment that I started questioning myself. That is, that is something that I, I think it happens to everyone at some point. 
you you begin to question where you're standing um, in your personal views, in your political stance. Um, how are you going to see the world? At that time, I was um, I was doing something completely different. Uh, I was working. I was auditioning for uh, various ballet um, companies, and yet I came across this 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 path that just converged into two different um, different roads. I I was faced with the 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 question of whether I wanted to do activism and dedicate my life to it or whether I wanted to just um, stay mellow and and watch as the world just passed me by. And that is when I decided to, that I wanted to get into this full time. Um, it was something that I was passionate about and it was something that it felt like a necessity, felt like a duty to, to an extent. Um, we as activists, we usually tend to um, like she just said, we tend to burn out really quickly. And that is mainly because we are always trying to be there at all times because the climate crisis in particular, it doesn't stop. It is a constant issue that we are living with every second of our lives. Some live it, um, live with it closer than, than others, but it is still there. And we, we can actually see physical consequences of this ever growing crisis so we always have to be there and we tend to burn out really quickly and get really overwhelmed in short amounts pe short periods of time and to an, it, it gets to a point where I, I i know i'm not the only one where we start saying well what, what comes first uh, what am i going to prioritize my mental health my kind of um physical and mental stability or, or this issue that is not only affecting me. And I think that is, a, that is an issue also of, of how much are we willing to take uh, being one of the peoples in the, or the youth being one of the, uh, the, the groups in the front lines of the climate crisis, how much are we willing to take before action is, is seen? Um, so this is this is uh, the first kind of issue I wanted to address as as climate activists because I'm I'm sure that many of you can relate to this um, to actually being in this um, constant questioning of am I what am I willing to sacrifice so that others don't have to suffer because of this um, and I don't have much to say about this except that it is completely personal and that we have to also become closer in this kind of network of activists and scientists and people in politics and stakeholders, whatnot, not only in making the decisions, because it becomes, it, it gets to a point where we are just taking um, hit after hit after hit, and we are still not seeing results. That is why, and, and coming back to a couple of years ago when the climate crisis became this, um, in the media at least, uh, came to the front pages, we are done with taking those shots and that's when we need action. Now that, that is why we are pressuring even more for, for action, for actual um, and physical proof that there is something being done. Um, so that is a little bit about me. That is a bit, a bit about my thoughts. And I hope that, that you can take this away a bit on, on how we as activists are, are working because we tend to think of activism um in into this kind of other dimension and people see us as oh you're an activist instead of actually thinking you know we are we're still young we're still really young um she mentioned um she was just starting um university i'm just finishing high school and that is a, a, a kind of like a barrier that we have to break uh so i i hope i, I left you with with some questions in your mind um that that you can actually take away from from the session one thing uh question yourselves um on this so thank you thank you um now i will give the word back to regini thank you well if anything actually i think regini is about to introduce herself as well um so i think well she's sort of the lead moderator here so honestly thank you Regini, for taking on that role and she's honestly been such an icon during this entire preparation 
and it would not have happened without Regini. So I'll pass on to you. Thank you. Honestly, thank you so much for that, Aoife. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Ragni Malhotra. I'm a 17-year-old activist from India, which is in Asia. And I actually got into activism last March, right after my exams ended. And I soon realized that the problem in my country was that there was a lack of awareness about what we were advocating for or what we were advocating against. So if we told someone to ban the, or to um, ignore fast fashion companies, they knew to do it, but they didn't know the why behind it. So essentially, my main aim became educating uh, people at a grassroots level and really going to the bottom of the supply chain. So when the pandemic hit us, you know, Every, everything had to move online. And one of my friends introduced me to the pop movement. And with the help of pop, I've developed a project which I'm hoping to take forward after the, you know, once the pandemic is under control. And it's basically about economic independence while tackling fast fashion. So yeah, that's a bit about me, but I strongly believe um, in educating people at a grassroots level and educating them about why we're, get why why we're why we're against something or why we're for something instead of just trying to get them on our side we need to educate them so yeah that's um that's a bit about me but um honestly i would like to shift the focus onto meda and jerry and kelsey so we have um so next up we have meda hope from uganda meda are you here I don't think I think, I think she's not there. Uh, maybe uh, you can invite someone else and I'll follow up with her. Thank you. Perhaps there was a bit of an issue there with the connection, but um I well now it is the perfect opportunity to um introduce um Kelsey to tell us a bit more about your own story and you know your life with activism. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, and hi, everyone. Um, thank you for the invitation to speak this morning. It's very early in Australia, so it's a very good morning to you. Um, and I'm really honoured to be presenting the uh, Australian voice here to the discussion. I hope that um, it might add a bit of value or you might learn something about um, youth activism here in Australia if you don't already have an idea of it. So just by way of a quick introduction, um, yeah, my name is Kelsey. I'm a 21-year-old climate advocate from Newcastle, Australia. Um, and I was most recently a member of the Australian delegation to Mock COP26. Um, I study a Bachelor of Law at the University um, of Newcastle. And I also combine that with a Bachelor of Science majoring in biology and environmental sciences. And my view is that I will combine my scientific understanding of climate change with my training in law to one day represent Australia as a climate diplomat. So I did represent Australia as a youth delegate at COP23 in 2017, um, a couple of years ago. And now I'm currently working with the Department of Foreign Affairs in Australia to increase youth involvement in international climate negotiations. So I am um, committed to elevating the youth voice um, on an international stage, but I'm equally very passionate about community level activism and youth engagement. So um, I'm currently doing a lot of work um, advocating for the sustainable development goals, particularly SDG 13 um, in my, um, my city of Newcastle. Um, and on an international stage, um, involvement with the United Nations Environment Programme, a major group on children and youth, um, an ambassador position with, with Thought for Food, which is an organisation focused on food systems and agricultural sustainability. Um, and I volunteer with a few different um, public interest environmental law litigation clinics um, in Australia as well. Uh, did you want me to continue on with the speech or was just the introduction for now? Well, it's the introduction, but I think what's really important is just to hear a bit more about your own insight into what it really means and the environment that, you know, we're in as climate activists. Okay, sorry, so you did want me to keep going? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so I guess um, I am 21, so I did come into the climate activism scene um, quite later in life, I would suppose, um, compared to yeah, the other teenagers that are joining us um, at the moment in this, uh, in this webinar. So um, as I will probably talk about later, I 
don't think that age is a certain barrier. It's never too late to start and there's no one type of activist. So whatever um, experiences or unique worldviews or um, skills which you might have is always a valuable contribution to the cause of climate activism. So um, even though I really only became actively involved when I started university, um, I think that you know, it's never too late to actually have um, your voice heard or to get that empowerment um, to contribute to meaningful um, climate solutions. So, uh, yeah, I, I suppose I don't have the most compelling story or a very um, meaningful background as to why I am here. I suppose it has just always been a connection to the planet and um, from a young age, always caring about um, the environment and wanting to have a positive contribution and then choosing to study that at university. And at university, I more and more found my voice and then I had that opportunity to go to COP and I realized that the youth voice is so disenfranchised at an international level um, and um, in the domestic scene as well. Um, so it was that experience at COP, uh, which really drew to light just how much um, the youth voice is not valued. Uh, in the COP process and the international negotiations, which is something which I'm trying to work on uh, at the moment. So yeah, I, I'd be happy to come back and talk about that uh, a bit later. Um, thank you so much for that, Kelsey, and we'll definitely circle back to you. Um, up next, we've got Jerry from South Korea. Jerry, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, you, can, you can go ahead now. Oh, hello, and thank you for inviting me to this uh, event. Uh, I'm 14 year old from South Korea. I am the youngest campaigner of Greenpeace Korea and a member of Youth for Climate Action Korea, as well as the chair of Climate Education Youth Steering Company, working closely with the Ministry of Environment and Education to enhance and expand environmental education provided in my country. And like Kelsey, I just participated in MOXIO P26 as a delegate of South Korea. And uh, my activism was like a cure for my suffering with the most fatal mental illness called anorexia nervosa. If you know about eating disorders, you would also know how difficult it is to shift your integral focus from food to something else. But then when I learned about climate change and its significance of the urgency of mitigating and adapting to it, uh, I felt the obligation to raise my voice and take direct action to prevent further damages to the present and the future. And this just manifests how important fighting against climate change was for me and my generation. Uh, through my activism, I developed a keen mind to view global events. So to understand climate change and its cause and effects, I developed my interest in international relations and global like politics, as well as some science behind climate change. To mitigate climate change, uh, systems must change. And the ones who can change the systems right now are the politicians. To persuade them and to change national and international systems, I must get a general overview of the different parties and their interests. So by monitoring the National Assembly on its process on the Green New Deal, I got to learn about different politicians in my country and their stances on different uh, national agendas. Moreover, I realized that climate change is not just one country's issue. It is a global issue that every stakeholder of the international community must devote in solving. So I researched further into learning about climate change issues around the world and how each country is dealing with it. And now that I've developed a larger vision of the world, I develop an ability to connect the issue on climate change with the surrounding world. For example, climate change is tightly intertwined with human rights. And I believe that there are so many things that youth can do to fight against climate change other than rallies or protests. So to fight, um, for example, I am participating in competitions or events and conferences held by relevant ministries because uh, it is a source of voicing yourself. Um, and I'm currently in grade eight as I'm 14 year old. 
And my school has never taught me these things about uh, climate change and a specific, uh, like the fundamental concepts. And when people get to know about my activism, they wonder how I balance all of my academics, extracurriculars, and being the school president and climate activism. And I have to admit that my schedule is definitely like packed as I invest a lot of my time away from schoolwork on doing things that are relevant to climate activism. However, once you become an activist and fully understand the cause you're fighting for is worth it, you'll enjoy what you're doing and feel proud for making progress. And you prioritize your time and effort spent into that cause because you're doing the right thing. So right now in my country, South Korea, uh, and the organization in Greenpeace Korea, I'm the youngest, and which means that I have to always communicate with people who are older than me and sometimes people who have contrasting views on climate change. And by interacting and dealing with people who have different stances, I, was, I became like more open-minded and sociable. And I know that I wouldn't have been able to do all this or become a different person without engaging with the society and the people outside of school to take action for climate justice. So uh, my end remark would be that uh, people should stop thinking that, thinking like I'm just one of the many, many because youth climate movement, even though it's still growing at an exponential rate, we need a greater, bigger voice from the majority. So um, I would recommend, I would like welcome anyone who shows interest and uh, passion for climate activism to join in the youth climate movement. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jerry. Um, before we circle back to Kelsey, um, I would like Meda to introduce herself. Hello everyone, I'm Melina Mida Hope. I'm from Uganda, General Coordinator and Founder of BKG Africa. In fact, we're the four activists. I'm joining Aifa, um, Ragini, and Camila. Glad to be part of this session and we hope to give it our best shot. I'm a secretary. Thank you, Mela. Thank you. And I would just like to say as well, actually, Cherry, honestly, everything there it was. It was just wow. It was very much that kind of impression it left on me. And I think that that resonates with a lot of others. And a lot of you, what you said in terms of how we often feel as activists and how as individuals, there's a lot more to us, I think is, is so, so true. It really does ring true with me. Um, but yeah, I guess back to you, Kelsey, as well. It'd be, to hear, it'd be lovely to hear a bit more maybe um, into just that kind of that personal, that, the, you know, that human side of things, especially because people often distinguish, you know, the activist from the person. I feel like often they're quite intertwined and it's not like we're a separate category of people, you know, we are very human, we are, you know, there's a lot to us and I feel as though that's something that a lot of people don't necessarily understand. So, I mean, it would be lovely to maybe hear a bit more in your story there and, and your thoughts around that. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, if I could give a bit of an overview about the situation in Australia, um, people would probably be aware of the devastating bushfires which Australia experienced um, in the 2019 to 2020 um, summer period. Uh, we lost 20 million hectares of land, 3 billion animals um, and the lives of 34 people. And I think that was a big moment for me. I actually wasn't in Australia at the time. Um, I spent 11 months living and working in Asia. So in January, I was actually in Timor-Leste. Um, so uh, uh, relatively close to Australia, Timor-Leste is actually uh, one of the closest neighbours, but um, still watching it from afar was absolutely devastating for me. And while my home was safe, I know that um, so many of my friends' homes were not and um, entire communities were being evacuated. And um, yeah, we needed like the military to come in and provide support, um, food and water for people who were forced to uh, flee due to these fires encroaching on their homes. And one key thing for me was the media's role in covering these fires. So some of the language used was that it was unprecedented. It was a, a once in a century, it was unforeseen. And I think 
young people sort of looked at that messaging and said no like that we don't accept that because the chief fire commissioner had already been warning that um you know climate change was going to induce fires at a level of catastrophe and destruction which we had never seen before and I think there was a sense of disillusionment that the government had not heeded those warnings you know why did we not react to that when we knew that um, this was coming, it was not unforeseen. And I think it was from that sense of disillusionment and despair that the youth activism scene in Australia did pick up quite a bit. And definitely personally, it did for me as well. Um, I guess just a sense of how our national leaders could let so much of our land and wildlife perish and actively ignore the climate science uh, and then um, have that um, level of devastation which the fires did um, unleash uh, on our wildlife and our land. So from that, um, thankfully there has been a thriving youth activist movement. Uh, we had hundreds of thousands of students go on strike in September 2020. Um, and as I am no longer in high school, um, I just stand in solidarity with that movement and I only wish it was around when I was in high school as well. Uh, so that's sort of uh, the origin for me, I suppose, in really amping up my own personal climate activism um, and then recently participating in Mock Cop as well uh, was motivated by the desire to elevate the voice of young people who too often are marginalised in international climate negotiations. And I wanted to be a part of shaping future policies as directed by youth, which will reach that 1.5 degree target set by the IPCC. Um, and uh, represent the highest ambition which we need from world leaders if we are truly going to curb the impacts of climate change or the worst impacts as we already are experiencing it. Another key motivation for me uh, was the fact that Australia's COVID recovery plan is um, a retrograde step. Um, it's investing in gas and more fossil fuels um, as a means of quickly generating income for our economy and the head of our COVID recovery commission is a former director of a gas company. So um, once again, we sort of have that sense of disillusionment and thinking, where are the, where's the national leadership here in actually um, representing the progression and the ambition that we need to combat the issue of climate change? So that was another particular reason why I became much more um, active and involved and politically engaged, I suppose, um, and trying to affect uh, positive change on international level. Uh, the, the one other thing I might mention about um, something like Mock Cop as well, or um, listening to youth from around the world on the issue of climate change is that um, it is such a human issue and it touches everyone individually. Um, people have personal grief attached to climate change. I'm fortunate in that I haven't been impacted in that way. For me, it's just a sense of moral duty um, and being extremely passionate about it, but I don't have that personal grief attached to it. Um, but that doesn't mean anyone's um, role as an activist is any less valid. Um, we all have something to contribute and it's just been really profound to hear from young people around the world as to how um, this is actually impacting them on a personal human level. So in the Australian delegation, we really had um, such a diverse array of experiences. We had a bushfire survivor, uh, we had a school striker, and we had a First Nations, um, First Nations man. So I think collectively there's just so much diversity within Australia and, uh, of course, across the world uh, that it has been really um, eye-opening and profound for me to be able to reflect on the, the personal ways in which the climate crisis is impacting us on that human level. Um, I might just finish up with a little bit of a reflection on what I'm currently doing um, and what I have learnt from climate activism personally. Um, so as I mentioned, um, my key focus is on elevating uh, youth engagement at an international level. So I'm currently um, working with the Department of Foreign Affairs uh, with a new task force. And by new, I mean it's launching tomorrow, so very new. Um, and it's a task force or a network 
which is aiming to bring together young climate activists with an interest in forums such as the United Nations Framework Convention. And it'll be an opportunity to engage with Australia's presence in international climate forums um, and be informed as to the Australian involvement in COP processes. And I think that's really important because we have a level of understanding of domestic policies, but I still think that the international arena is filled with mystique and we don't fully know how our countries are approaching these issues or how they approach international negotiations. And of course, it's not listening to diverse voices. It's not listening to youth. It's not listening to our First Nations peoples. So I think that um, any way that we can incorporate the youth voice into um, Australia's presence at COP um, can only be improved. And from my own experience at COP in 2017, while I was there as a youth delegate for Australia, I felt that my presence could have been much more constructive. Um, we didn't, for example, we didn't get regular briefings with the delegation. We weren't given um, the opportunity to understand what Australia's position was um, approaching each negotiation session. So while it was an incredible experience and I was extremely grateful, uh, it was something which you know, I, I felt motivated to change after participating. So just to finish up, I suppose my key messages about climate activism. Firstly, as I said at the start, there is no one type of climate activist. Um, I feel like I came into this very late and I don't have yeah, much of a compelling story. It's just been experiences um, and a, a passion for me. Um, but we each have unique values and experiences um, and inherent motivators. What matters is that you have the right purpose and uh, you have um, the right motivations behind it. So for me, I may not be the loudest person in the room, but I do have an ability to be empathetic, um, problem solve and negotiate as well. Um, and then the final thing as well is listening to diverse voices and ensuring that there is diversity in climate discussions, um, because that is key. We all have something to contribute um, in an Australian context. I think that that means listening to the voices of First Nations peoples um, who have been looking, looking after and caring for our land for hundreds of thousands of years and who hold those traditional practices which we can learn so much from and taking that onto a broader scale, uh, listening to the voices of our closest neighbours in the Pacific Islands uh, who, whose culture and way of life is extremely vulnerable to climate change and Australia could really take much more of a stronger leadership position in the Pacific. So I think that there's so much to learn just from listening to those voices of the people that are most affected by it. And that's something which I'm definitely trying to incorporate into my own personal style of activism is to listen, reflect, um, and really think about what it means to address the human um, personal impacts of climate. So I'll wrap it up there. Sorry if that went on for a bit too long. Um, but yeah, if there's any more questions, I'd be happy to um, answer with anything else. No, I mean, that was perfect. Um, thank you so much. We have got one question, which I think would be directed a bit more towards Jerry, since, you know, as young people, we're often told that, you know, we're, it's, it's often hard for us to build our network. So the question is that what kind of tools or resources have helped you as a climate ad advocate and what do you think could help future climate advocates? May I go on? So I feel like uh, some resources, especially uh, from like the anecdotes or stories, their situations of people who are most affected by climate change would have been very, very helpful in the initial stage of my climate activism because in the beginning, I started with just the basic science, some like things that are on the internet, but not much about what the indigenous people think or the people of uh, LD LEDCs feel like as uh, residents of a country in the global north and just a young student just acting for what she really believes in. Uh, I think I wasn't as uh, 
grateful in great in representing the whole community as climate change is a global goal of the world and it's not just one country solving just one's national issues so i believe that if i was able to access better more easy like stories about people who are most affected the most vulnerable i would have been able to represent the greater audience the greater community so this would help uh new climate advocates i guess thank you so much cherry again wonderful to hear your voice and i mean we've got a couple minutes um left before the session has to come to a close. Um, however, having said that, I don't know if there are any really key things that people want to point out. I mean, do feel free to just say, um, because this entire session, I think it's really achieved that goal of being insightful, of really hearing our stories. Um, and I mean, even Cherry, if you want to maybe go on a little bit more about a more personal experience as well, feel free to. Um, but yeah, thank you. Um, there was a question which was someone from my Climate Advocates Network had for she, which is that, um, you know, in her journey as a climate advocate, she has been more successful than most people have. So what sort of advice or what do you think helped you reach that level where your voice was on such a large platform? Um, for me, that's a great question. Um, because for me, it just came out of nowhere, honestly. I just, my first ever speech was at Columbia University, not organized by Columbia University, just organized by students at Columbia. And they just invited me to give a speech on a megaphone. And that was the first ever time that I spoke at something. And from there, I went to the next thing and the next thing. And it's literally about making space for yourself because no one is going to invite you if you don't make space for yourself. It's about showing up. It's about um, people knowing who you are in your community, people knowing that, oh, that's the girl who always comes to the strike. That's the girl who always comes to the meetings. That's the girl who is always there. And that was me for many months, many, many months before um, I started getting higher level speaking opportunities. So I my first ever speech at an international arena was in Malaysia in 2015, um, 2017 when I was 15. So that was three years ago, even before the youth climate movement exploded. So it's about showing up, it's about people knowing your name and just saying what you're feeling, telling your story because a lot of people here said they don't really have a story, but you do. And I think you, we all have to own that. You just realizing that you have to do something. You just realizing that, like Camila said, I think what Camila said was really inspirational. You had two paths, ballet or activism, and you chose activism. And something similar happened to me. I had gymnastics or activism, and I chose activism, right? And it's so many choices that we have to make. But at the end of the day, it's about incorporating kind of all of them together and saying, maybe I can still do some dancing and I can still do some gymnastics and I can still sing some, even though I can't sing at all, but I like to do it. Um, so it's about showing up. It's about uh, choosing your path and it's about owning your story. Super powerful words. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, I really wish this conversation could go on longer, but we have reached that half hour point. Um, although I think what would be really beautiful is if we commemorate this moment, maybe with a screenshot, so if people are happy, just give it a smile. Um, and I would be happy to take that screenshot um, and share around our network as well. If you want to share that on your social medias, um, do feel free to turn on your video if you want to. Um, but yeah, anyways, so three, two, one. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, everyone. And I will share that around so you can all have a, have a look. But yeah, thank you all for coming along. We really do appreciate what you've given here at this session. And um, yeah, thank you. I'll pass it on to you, Regini, to wrap things up. Um, 
before we wrap things up, I'm just going to be dropping the social media IDs of um, the social media handles of Pop across all platforms. And I'm going to be dropping the email IDs of, um, of the four of us, who is me, Camila, Maida, and Aoife. So if you have any questions, if you want to reach out regarding anything, if you have feedbacks, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Again, I know that, you know, this time it, it's early morning for someone, it's late night for me played night for a lot of people so i just want to thank everyone for coming here once again um it's been an amazing session and we're so so happy that you took one hour out to come here and to listen to our voice because that's how the conversation moves forward and i just want to personally i just want to thank drisha who's our um who's basically been our pop mentor and she's i know she's kept up with us for the past few months and it's genuinely it's been so, so it's, it's been a pleasure working with pop and we're not done yet, but yeah. So that's about it. I'm going to be dropping the Instagram handle and the email IDs of all of us in the chat box. So you can just take a screenshot or you can just search up Pop Movement um, and you'll, from our website, you can access the social media platforms. Thank you so much. Thank you Thanks all so much. Me. Wonderful. Thank you. Guys, thank you, Shia. Thank you, Ragini, Aifa, Camila, Kelsey, Cher Sherry. Great to great to uh, get great to get to meet you, Drisha. Many thanks, and to each one of you for being here. A big hug. Stay safe, and many many thanks again. Amazing. Um, but anyways, I think Ragini will probably pop those in. And also, if you check out the pop social media, we are tagged in summer post there but yeah again thank you all and good night or good morning or good afternoon i mean it's night for me at least but yeah <laughs> thank you all. bye bye thank you all thank you thank you thank you so much for for being here it was amazing um getting to know all of you and those who didn't speak um we would love to to meet you more in depth so sure send us an email send us a dm and whatever and we can continue growing this this network of activists and of people that are trying to do their best. It was great meeting you all. Um, thank you all for the turn up. Um, thanks to the team of advocates for handling the survey. And yeah, it's a really nice session. Thank you so much, guys. Oh, wait, I'm just going to drop my Instagram ID here. Oh, and a quick reminder for the next session as well that Pop will be hosting. Um, um, but yeah, this entire festival, absolutely fantastic. Some amazing, amazing organizers. Um, just to echo what Rogini said there, it has been such an honor to work with the Pop family and to continue working. Um, but yeah, go go check out our stories as well on, on our own social medias. I will say I don't really post that much, but um, that does negate the fact that even as individuals, we do quite a lot and a lot of work and effort goes into that but yeah thank you all and yeah hopefully we'll see each other very soon but yeah bye you thank, thank you thank you everybody for joining us and stay connected with us on the social media and you will get more updates about the sessions that are going to happen on day two three four and five <laughs> see you then bye-bye thank you thank you so much bye.